Good morning. Welcome to the symposium, Modern Alchemy, New Technologies for Museum Collections. I'm Dwayne King, Vice President for Museum Affairs at the University of Tulsa and Executive Director of the Helmrick Center for American Research. I want to thank you for your support of the Center's Advanced Seminar Series and Visiting Scholars Program. This is our fourth symposium, and we have 10 outstanding scholars with us today and tomorrow to share with you the exciting findings from their research. All of the scholars are widely known in their fields and all represent very prestigious institutions. Some of the research that will be reported was done on the collections of the Oak Museum. Some of the research was conducted on other collections but had very broad implications. The findings presented at this symposium, in many cases, have not been previously reported or published. We're privileged to be the first audience with which some recent discoveries will be shared. The format for this symposium will be different than our previous symposia in that we will have individual presentations as well as panel discussions and the opportunity for questions and answers with the panelists. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for the symposium, Dr. Holly Mitchie, Director of the Lee Project at Western Reserve University. Dr. Mitchie has a PhD in European painting and sculpture and 25 years experience as a museum professional. In her current position, she heads a multi-year collaborative project to create a new model for studying the role of families in the development of urban cultural centers in the United States. She teaches ethics and convergence issues online in the Museum Studies program at John Hopkins University and traditional museum studies at Case Western Reserve University for the Department of Art History. Her research interests currently focus on North American perceptions of museums prior to the building of the nation's first great museums in the late 19th century. Please help me welcome Dr. Holly Ritchie. so there may be some technical issues. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here today. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Dr. King, for uh, allowing me to moderate. Uh, this is my second trip to Tulsa. I spent yesterday wandering around the city. What a wonderful town you live in and how nice everyone is. Uh, my topic today, and, and what I'm going to do is, I'm going to call them keynote remarks. I'm going to speak very briefly, and I love the idea of keynote, um, not as sort of a, let's get you all excited about the, the coming presentations, although I want that to happen too, but I want to set a framework for you to listen to the coming presentations. And my topic is um, Modern Alchemy, the Ringmaster's Secret. You'll see why in a minute. So we all know about alchemists, right? Medieval alchemists. We all have in our heads the idea of that person in the Middle Ages um, who is trying to turn lead into gold. There are a number of chemists that you will hear over the next couple of days or people with chemical experience who will tell you that it can't be done. So we're not going to talk about actually turning lead into gold. We're going to talk about what it means to to transmute, to transform um, things into wonderful things. That's the technical term, transform things into wonderful things. And just in case you'd like a picture of uh, a painting of a medieval alchemist, there he is in his studio using equipment that the average person can't understand, to do things that the average person can't understand, to get you excited. So all of these people sitting in front of me do wonderful things, make no mistake. So what does this have to do, and why is my presentation, my remarks called The Ringmaster's Secret? 
Life can be wonderful, it can be magical, it can be mysterious. I want to tell you three quick stories about wonderful, magical, mysterious lives. The first one has to do with the Nancy Drew mystery, The Ringmaster's Secret. I was eight years old, I was sick. Because I was sick, I had to stay home from school. When I stayed home from school, I got to sleep in my parents' bed. And at the end of the day, my father, who was a geologist, brought me home a present. It was my first Nancy Drew mystery. He handed me the Ringmaster's Secret, and as he was leaving the room, he said, I used to read this when I was a little girl. <laughs> You know, for the next hour, I worried about when my father who was a little girl and did that mean that I might turn into a little boy. The second one has to do with that fire hydrant. I have a 23-year-old son who's at Columbia, but when he was eight years old, we were driving to University Circle near where I work, and we stopped at a stop sign, and he looked over at the fire hydrant, and he said, Mom, you know, one of the things I don't understand is how they get all the water inside. <laughs> it's magical, isn't it, when you think about it from an eight-year-old's perspective. He just thinks that somehow we're able to compress all, all that water into that little space. The third one is a 9-11 story. Um, on 9-11, I was actually in Brighton, England, working on a website for the Clean Museum of Art with our consultant's cognitive applications. And as soon as the towers went down, it became clear that I was not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, the hotel that I was staying in quickly filled up with first-class passengers from United, so I did not have a place to stay. And I had to go into a bed and breakfast way across the city. And every day I would go to work at Cognitive Applications, and I would work all day because there was nothing else to do. And at night, I would walk home, and I used to pass this lingerie store. And I'm not a small girl. <laughs> I've never been a small girl. But this lingerie looks so beautiful, and so every night I thought, well, before I go home, I've got to buy some lingerie. And finally it occurred to me, the reason I like that lingerie store so much is that the mannequins were illuminated. That's what made the lingerie look so good. I do not actually illuminate, so I don't know. <laughs> Museums can be wonderful, magical, mysterious, too. I just brought three of my favorite things, the wonderful Niagara Falls from the Gilcrease Collection. Durer's uh, self-portrait as an artist, and this wonderful Burgundian table fountain. It's the only one like it anywhere in the world today that's at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Libraries and archives, too, are magical and mysterious places. I put that picture of the card catalog, and these are the stacks where I work um, on the lower left at Western Reserve Historical Society, um, which every time I go up into the stacks, and I only have, my collection is only 15 boxes in the stacks. Um, but every time I go up there, I feel like Indiana Jones. Um, and I never know what the wonderful thing is I'm going to learn about. So we are here for the next day and a half to talk about technologies. New technologies can enhance our experiences of collections. They can also undermine our experiences of collections. Um, so the question we want to ask ourselves before we do a technology project in a museum, an archive, or library is, are we trying to turn lead into gold, or are we planning to turn gold into a lot of lead? You know, that's sort of in the back of our minds. Every person who's coming in here today is turning lead into gold. I want to assure you of that. Um, so I want you to listen to the talks for the next couple, of, for the next day and a half, for these four things, purpose, passion, pivots, and persistence. Because I'll bet if I sat and talked about these four topics with the speakers, that we would find um, everybody starts out with purpose. If you don't have a purpose, right? You're not, you're not going to go very far. In museums, in archives, in libraries, when we do large-scale technology projects, even if there is a person behind the original project, we're asking everybody else in the institution to have faith in what we're doing. So you have to have a strong purpose, first of all. And you have to have passion. Those of you who have anything to do with museum exhibitions, no, you don't do a museum exhibition, do you? You don't do a museum exhibition in three days or three weeks, do you? Susan, does it take a little bit longer than that? What's the average lifespan of an exhibition? Start to finish. Three years. So again, um, you're asking, the curator is asking all of you to have faith for that entire three years. So purpose, passion, pivots. 
Pivots is something we don't often talk about in the museum and archive and library world because we kind of have the feeling if we have to pivot that maybe we've done something wrong. Let me assure you, pivots are good. Any businessmen and women out there? Raise your hand if you're a businessman or woman. There you go. Ever had to pivot in your life? Change that project slightly. And persistence. If you're going to work on a project that takes three years, if you're going to work on a project that takes seven years, you better have persistence. Um, and tomorrow at the end of the session, I'll give you my fifth P. And that's my promise to you. So, you're going to listen to these fantastic speakers um, and listen for purpose, passion, pivots, and persistence. Thank you, and let's get started. I'm going to go to the bathroom because I'm going to take notes of what they're saying, so do not think that I'm checking my email. I'm listening very carefully. Um, let's get started.